Now, a lot of people don't see economic sanctions as warfare, right? The, the, the way economic sanctions are presented is, is they're just punishments for breaking the social contract of the world, right? It's like, it's like smacking a country right in the butt. That's what, but in reality, it is a punishment for rejecting imperialism. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm Krish Mohan. Before we dive into this week's episode, just as a little friendly reminder at the top of the show that if you would like to contribute to the show financially, uh, you can do so by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha uh, for only two dollars a month you get exclusive unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material as well as early access to full multi-part fork full of noodles like this following episode that you're going to see you get to see both parts all in one uh earlier than anybody else would uh, and it all starts at only two dollars a month that's the cost of one cup of coffee that's one cup of coffee that's all it costs uh go check it out patreon.com slash krishmohan ha ha and uh all the work that you see in in these shows is done just by me so you'll be helping out this show uh taboo table talk my diy stand-up comedy touring and much much more once again that's patreon.com slash krishmohan ha ha so before we get into this week's episode of fork full of noodles i just want to let everybody know this is part two um, part one was, was last week. So if you want to go back and listen to that episode, you totally, uh, should, you can, uh, you, you totally should. Uh, this episode gets into some intense subject matter, uh, regarding veteran suicide. Uh, so just wanted to give you guys a heads up about that. Uh, so let's get into it. The second reason we need to be anti-war is to push back against the financial costs of war. And this is a, another bipartisan issue in Congress because both Democrats and Republicans believe that we need to spend more on our wars. Yeah, and I mean, even if we look ahead to, to 2020, let's hypothetically say that, you know, Biden, let's say that Biden's too toxic and he doesn't win. But yeah. let's look at Warren. I mean, Warren has been incredibly vocal about, you know, uh, making sure that our military remains strong and making sure that uh, that we, we stay on top of the war on terror and things like that. Yep. So she doesn't seem any less hawkish than the next person. No, and there's no reason to think that she would go out on a limb. Democrats like Pelosi and Warren voted to increase Trump's military budget. I mean, America's military spending is more frivolous than a teenager spending all their money at Hot Topic to feel like they're getting an authentic goth experience. Authentic God experience don't come from a fucking box store, okay? They, they come from the void in your heart. Because nobody understands your pain, and then and then you listen uh, to you know uh, either like black metal or just uh, probably a little bit little bit too much My Chemical Romance. That's where authentic God comes from. It comes from the heart. As the Afghan papers revealed, one contractor was expected to spend about three million dollars per day in just one Afghan district. Uh. Uh, one one unidentified contractor told government interviewers he was expected to dole out three million dollars daily for projects in a single Afghan district, roughly the size of a U.S. county. No, I mean, it's completely perverse. Uh, and this is just whenever you hear anyone say, you know, how are you going to pay for public health, you know, programs? How are you wow. going to pay for, you know, making university tuition free? It's like, well, look at what's right. happening daily in Afghanistan and elsewhere where the U.S. military is posted. One of the things that because, so the, essentially it's, there is no policy other than trying to buy people off. Right. Warlords, uh, uh, politicians, Karzai, and there is kind of unlimited funds to do it. But the report argues that through that tactic, 
Uh, they destroyed the popular legitimacy of the Afghan government they were fighting to prop up, right. with judges and police chiefs and bureaucrats extorting bribes. Many Afghans soured on what was presented as democracy and turned to the Taliban to enforce order. So and, I mean, most of that involved bribing warlords and b politicians, which only made the Taliban a more legitimate governing body in that region. This wasteful spending isn't just in these false humanitarian missions, but also in weapons contracting. Right, The day that Soleimani was illegally assassinated by the American government, the stocks of the war profiteering companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and Boeing shot through the roof. The new impending war is good for the blood-soaked business of the elite American warlords. I mean, they sell to every side, and they're the only winners of these wars. And then again, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're the only ones looking to be winners in these wars. In 1961, President Eisenhower pointed out the permanent ar arms industry that spends more than all of the corporations combined. He warned us that we should not be influenced by the military-industrial complex. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. But apparently we didn't heed his warning because we've made these war profiteers richer and richer with our never-ending conflicts. Their word. I would, I would just call it a, a never-ending war, a war that just keeps going on and on forever and ever because that's what you fucking need to keep this cycle of bloodshed and money pouring into your fucking pockets. And, you know, we've reached our potential for misplacing power, not in the arms of the people, but in corporate armaments that we think are going to defend us from an enemy that doesn't really exist. But, you know, the sheer amount of weapons that are sold in the Middle East, sometimes it can, it can be really hard for the American warlords to keep track of all of it. In 2015, the Pentagon said it lost track of $500 million worth of small munitions and military equipment in Yemen. So who took this supply? Well, either Iranian-backed rebels or Al-Qaeda or ISIS or... The Nazis, or the Bolsheviks, or the Gremlins. You know, sometimes we're not even selling weapons to our enemies. They just kind of happenstance on it because America just has so many weapons that we just can't keep track of all of it. 
and and the way they handled it is is like the same way that a billionaire would handle losing a five dollar bill, right? They just kind of had a meeting about how to track it down, and eventually said, "Well, I have so many five dollar bills that this is just fine. Let's just make sure that we take extra secure measures to protect all of the rest of my fines. Arm the banks, like that's." In Iraq, America spent $25 billion in training Iraqi soldiers, and now the military is refusing to leave the country. It's like they're uncertain whether or not they were a good enough teacher or not, right? I mean, here's the thing. How much do we spend on training our people here at home to, to find a purpose or meaning in their lives or, or just to help people? Or, or fuck, just to build some bridges. I mean, we have a crumbling infrastructure, but no, instead, we are overspending on crumbling the infrastructure of the Middle East instead. Th- this, is, this is like the perfect and shittiest example of killing two birds with one stone. Eisenhower focused on reaching a balance in our society between juxtaposed idea of necessity and frivolity. Crises there will continue to be. In meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there is a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. A huge increase in newer elements of our defenses, development of unrealistic programs to cure every ill in agriculture, a dramatic expansion in basic and applied research, These and many other possibilities, each possibly promising in itself, may be suggested as the only way to the road we wish to travel. But each proposal must be weighed in the light of a broader consideration, the need to maintain balance in and among national programs. But because we have let these war profiteers control the narratives of security and safety, our balances shifted and skewed. Right now, the American war economy is run as part of our debt. And as investigative journalist Bob Henley points out, debt is about social control. I think it's important to look at debt as social control. The sense of you're basically, as a society, and this is true if it's your household or if it's a national government, you're making commitments uh, for the long term, for a short-term gain. If you do that repeatedly as a strategy for getting by, it's bankruptcy. And so what we have here, particularly in the case of the United States, is a point where we're at, I think, in the next couple of years, we'll be paying more in debt service. That's just servicing the debt some 700 to 800 billion dollars a year which will be larger than the defense appropriation itself most americans are struggling to get by we have more debts than we know what to do with right the middle class is burdened with car loans and house debt and credit card debt and the ever so popular student debt out of this desperation, the military-industrial complex offers debt relief in exchange for your service to go fight rich people's wars. The war machine borrows money from the banks, and in turn, our needed services are cut to pay for these wars. Wars that we did not ask for. The most blatant example of social control comes from economic sanctions. Now, a lot of people don't see economic sanctions as warfare, right? The, the, the way economic sanctions are presented is, is they're just punishments for breaking the social contract of the world, right? It's like, it's like smacking a country right in the butt. That's what, but in reality, it is a punishment for rejecting imperialism. So if we really want to be accurate about what these things are, we should start calling them economic warfare. Well, a point I like to make is that even when bombs are not dropping, the U.S. is waging a very sophisticated hybrid war against countries like Iran and Venezuela. This is something you and I have spoken about together. The reality is we're constantly waging an economic war against millions of people around the world, but we don't feel as a U.S. population as though we're at war. How can we change that? Well, I think the, you know, the, the alternative media plays a very big role. We have to um, humanize the, the real, what, what these words mean, you know, sanctions. I mean, it sounds like it's um, sort of like a fine, 
or something it, that, that's on some official and it and we don't see the the human suffering the the tens of thousands killed in venezuela as a result of sanctions for instance or you know the the half a million iraqi children um, that died because of sanctions uh, between the wars you know that that is a war that's a form of economic war absolutely and you know it's causing violence all the same in venezuela we saw the western powers put economic sanctions on a country that just didn't accept the false leadership bestowed upon by the american empire in venezuela wasn't able to get billions of dollars worth of revenue uh, from its company citgo revenue that it depends on to help people through social programs like universal health care and free groceries and now the same issues are happening in iran Iran is facing economic sanctions for defying the illegal assassination of a top-ranking official on a peacekeeping mission. I apologize if I screw up the following name, but Iranian filmmaker Mashani Satrapi said, we have more in common with each other than we do our respective government. And it rings true. Economic sanctions affect the middle class of any country that they are, the sanctions are put on. And with the ever-expanding budget of the American military, the American middle class can't afford things like health care or public education and so many more of our basic needs. It's almost like fueling the military-industrial complex. There is an economic sanction being put on the American people. And by almost, I mean that's exactly what the fuck is happening. There has never been more glaring evidence that the American empire stands against the middle class on a global scale with their fetish of putting economic sanctions on countries as an act of war. Bob Henley also talks about the way we fight these wars has changed by hiding the costs and the voluntary military. One of the things that we also need to keep in mind here is that this further notice war, which came to effect, was wholly different than any prior war the United States had fought. I'm very reliant on the brilliant scholarship of uh, Colonel Basevich, who is one of the is a top military historian, West Point graduate, and he's been writing about the change in the way that America has been fighting wars. And it's instructive. It's not just this economic way that because they actually hid the cost of the war, by the way. they Not only did they do this borrowing, but then they hid the borrowing because they made it an emergency resolution mm -hmm. so we didn't even see it. But a key thing that changed was we relied on a voluntary military, which meant that for the first time, America was disconnected from the stresses and strains of our military and their families. And this created the kind of notion that it was just a lifestyle choice. Historically, we fought until the war was over. As citizen soldiers, we fought until the duration. But if that duration is suspended forever in animation, then you have a further notice war and a professional class that is making their living by keeping the war going. And hence, surprise, surprise, we don't win them. Yes. It was sold to the people as a lifestyle choice, right? The work of the soldier is done at the end of the war, but at this point, these wars are never ending, so the work is never done. These wars just become something different. An evolving war is the only kind of evolution the empire believes in. And the same goes for the moral and social debt paid by the American veteran. Which brings us to the third and fourth reasons to be anti-war, the human and veteran cost of wars. Now, this is usually not seen by a lot of the civilian population, right? Uh, most of the time we find wars to be somewhat acceptable, not just because of the security theater and the propaganda of America being the good world's police, but it's also seen as so far away. I mean, it's not in front of my face, so why should I care about it? So we don't really see the true nature of what war is, but veterans do. And when they come home, a lot of times they bring it home with them. I mean, the sad fact is that the American veteran is one of the least taken care of persons in this country. Since the selling point of the American military is the lifestyle choice, the psychological and physical toll of warfare isn't really taken into account. 69-year-old Army veteran Jerry Holliman lost his prosthetic leg due to the fact that it might not be covered by Medicare or Medicaid. I mean, 
you'd think that if you served in a rich person's war that when you come home and you need a prosthetic limb, then you'd have all that covered with the blood money they just made. You know, but, but instead, they use very vague language about the cost of all of this and what they had to do to ensure that you don't get what you need. And Holyman addresses this in the report he made to the media. He says, I signed up with the understanding that they'd take care of me if something happened. I mean, it's almost like these legislators didn't understand what the repercussions of these wars were going to be. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like they're out of touch and out to make a buck over the suffering of the middle class as they sell them the idea of patriotism without actually telling them what the fucking cost of it is going to be. Holyman is also sure that the only reason he got his prosthetics back was because he reached out and told the media. Apparently, in the case of veterans, uh, snitches don't get stitches, but rather prosthetics and medical treatments that they need. And the real question is, why aren't prosthetics clearly covered in Medicare and Medicaid? And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the type of injuries veterans face, right? And because of the advances in military gear today, veterans are more protected, but that's just led to an increase of traumatic brain injuries. The one thing that is different, I think, for my generation uh, compared to previous generations is we have a lot more, uh, uh, is we, have, we have issues with traumatic brain injury. Um, we are surviving uh, things that previous generations would have been killed in. Um, I have Marines uh, who were in vehicles that were blown up nine, 10, 11 times. You know, um, I one time had a piece of shrapnel like this big hit my chest, right? You know, I mean, it just bounced right off. You know, I mean, m many of us survive things that would have either wounded us or killed us. And we just kept going like nothing happened. What would have killed the prior generation is just causing a latency of trauma in this generation. And it gives legislators uh, an excuse to say, well, I mean, you know, uh, that, that traumatic brain injury could, and, and, and trauma, it's all, all that could have been caused by, by anything. You know, it could, it could have been caused by, by, by uh, shell shock or uh, an IED or, or socialism. It's probably socialism. You, you, know, you, just, you, just, you just never know. Along with the tri physical trauma of warfare, they also suffer a lot of psychological trauma. As Matthew Ho of the Center for International Policy explains that a quarter to a third of World War II Army veterans were discharged as a psychiatric casualty. What we know about World War II veterans is that um, it doesn't matter, and what, any veterans, it doesn't matter uh, the purpose, uh, so much as your individual actions, mm. so much as what you have done, what you have taken part in. Um, look, uh, the, uh, the number of, of, of uh, psychiatric casualties in the United States Army coming out of Europe in the Second World War, World War something about one out of th one in three, almost one in between one and three, one in four uh, uh men who saw combat in Europe had, were discharged as a psychiatric casualty. I mean, that comes from the Army's own records. And this is stuff that PBS has reported, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, even in the 30s and 40s, American imperialism was so bad that a soldier's brain decided to go to war with itself. I mean, at this point, that just makes the military-industrial complex a disease, and in some cases a pre-existing condition. And we all know that we can't just keep funding these pre-existing conditions. Most combat veterans have trauma related to the individual actions that they took part in as a result of warfare. Veteran suicides, I don't think are anything new. Um, we, we don't have the data, but uh, anecdotally what we know, what we know uh, looking at rates of veterans uh, and various generations, looking at what we can see overseas, uh, they've looked at uh, veterans of, 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 of uh, uh, say, Serbian and Croatian veterans of those wars. You know, you see the same type of 
suicidality. The same uh, combat is linked to suicide. It's very clear. Uh, uh, just to get that part out of the way, uh, in 2015, the well, first of all, the first study that I know about was done by the Veterans Affairs Administration in 1991, and it clearly showed the best predictor of suicide in Vietnam veterans was combat-related guilt. Every, pretty much every study that's been done has shown that. Um, in 2015, uh, 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 the Veterans, uh, uh, the National Center for Veteran Studies at uh, the University of Utah did a uh, meta-analysis of all the different literature out there, the research, and that's what it found. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, it, there is a clear connection. And there's a, a myth that surrounds the fact that veterans don't have issues when they come home. And I think this notion persists in America because of the constant hero worship and thanking veterans for their service. I'd like to uh, paraphrase a friend of mine who is a combat vet when I asked him about thanking him for his service and w wishing him on Veterans Day. He said that as long as we stand up to the machine that wants to send people like him to die for the rich, we're good. So if you really want to support veterans, then be on the, their side and join the anti-war movement that's growing across America. But this is not really a new sentiment, right? Back in the days of Roman imperialism, they would send soldiers who seemed mentally unstable and put them in a special camp. And this sounds really similar to how certain cultures would have a, a special tent that they would build and, uh, and, and then they would put women who were going through menstruation in them because, uh, well, the humans uh, didn't understand how vaginas worked, hence why we came up with terms like pussyfooting. But look, we didn't understand at that point that men were allowed to have feelings and thoughts, and because we didn't understand that, we sent them to a special camp that acted as an imperial psych ward for thinking about morality too much. So basically, we isolated women and men who had too many feelings. And at this point, that's about what governments have decided to regulate, human emotions. In 1991, a study showed that most Vietnam veterans committed suicide because of combat-related guilt. And this trend has persisted throughout every war. Since 2009, veteran suicide rates were increasing and have surpassed their civilian counterpoints. And I was just talking about the United States. I mean, in, in Iraq, the, the, the veteran suicide rates were 14 times higher than their civilian counterparts. And as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were going on, that rate steadily climbed. And I think it was about 2009 or so that the rate of suicide for uh, active duty members surpassed the rate of suicide for the civilian population. Um, it might have been a little bit before that. It, and that's very concerning because it steadily has continu and it's continued to climb. Um, and it, it's very concerning because that shows that there is something broken within that support system. There's something broken within that bubble um, that is allowing these men and women to take their own lives. Yeah. You know, the uh, rates for Iraq and Afghan veterans who are killing themselves are six times higher than uh, their civilian peers. Yeah. So if you're a young man or woman who went to Iraq, you've got a six, you're six times more likely to kill yourself than someone who didn't, didn't go, right? Yeah. Um, for infantry units that we've tracked, the guys who've really seen the fighting, done the fighting and everything, um, we've seen rates as high as 14 times yeah. as their civilian peers. Just, I mean, that's just the case. I mean, you know, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't even begin to tell you all the number yeah. of people who've killed themselves, you know. So what has the government done to help fix this problem and provide support to veterans that they've sent over to fight for a, a piece of cloth and some black gold? Well, they gamified war, everybody. Get to get your get your consoles ready to go because we got point systems attached to how many terrorists you can kill. Right now, they are increasing drone warfare with unmanned aerial aircrafts to, you know, wrongfully destroy weddings and move on with our lives.
Once again, there is a better way to RSVP. No, Obama. There's just a better way to do it. You could just you could just send them just like an outline. If you press like your dick on on top of the of the invite and just write an outline of it, I'm pretty sure they'll understand that that's a no. Much better way. Less people have died. It's weird and kind of creepy, but less people officially died by that by that RSVP of no. But these drone operators also face PTSD, but their PTSD is more in a in a moral and spiritual capacity. And the war machine, well, it doesn't really care about spirituality. I don't even think it really understands what spiritualism is, right? I think the war machine believes that spiritualism is more about like making spirits out of our invented enemies. And then and then we'll have to shift the war again. Uh, and uh, and make it a war on spirits, you know, fucking ghost wars, government sponsored show on the Travel Channel, for how many seasons? TBD, TBD seasons. I mean, we could see twelve or twelve hundred. We're not sure. Look, if you still think that the effects of war don't affect us at home, then you're wrong. The middle class is used as cannon fodder for the rich, and it comes with a large set of consequences, which includes the warping of our moral fortitude. Both the physical and psychological toll that wars take on veterans is proof that our homes are ravaged by the effects of war. Now is the time to fight back against the war machine and stand up against it, and we can start by taking care of our veterans. Supporting wars and the expansion of militarism means that our emotions are hijacked by nationalism. But by taking on an anti-war stance, it gives us power over our emotions. It lets us think critically and ask important questions like, is this the necessary or right thing to do? Now, as Nathan P. Robinson of Current Affairs wrote, the job of an intelligent populace is to see whether these arguments actually withstand scrutiny. And it's time that we scrutinize this wasteful system. The anti-war movements might have gone dormant for a little while, but they are coming back, and we need all the support that we can get. The corporate media, a.k.a. The, the propaganda wing of the American war economy, would have you believe that the anti-war movements are not gaining steam. But after the attack on Iran, not only did we see mass po protests and demonstrations in America, but also in Iran. War affects every single one of us. Racially, it makes people who have more melanin in their skin the enemy. Financially, it cripples the middle class and uses them as cannon fodder for the rich. Environmentally, it pumps toxins into the air, not, and not only is it destroying cities and cultures across the globe, but the planet itself. And just legislatively, it just creates more hysterically nationalistic Congress members that have become mouthpieces for these never-ending wars. And it forgets the veterans that gave up their lives in service. Eisenhower could see the result of giving in to these vices. He saw the downfall of the empire like the soothsayer predicting the Ides of March. And it's time that we made the military-industrial complex and all the war profiteers say, A too highly patriotic American in the flyover states with the star-spangled banner truck nuts. A too at the end of his term, President Eisenhower vowed to be an anti-war activist and a voice for peace. Disarmament with mutual honor and confidence is a continuing imperative. Together we must learn how to compose differences, not with arms, but with intellect and decent purpose. Because this need is so sharp and apparent, I confess that I lay down my official responsibilities in this field with a definite sense of disappointment. As one who has witnessed the horror and the lingering sadness of war, as one who knows that another war could utterly destroy this civilization 
which has been so slowly and painfully built over thousands of years. I wish I could say tonight that a lasting peace is in sight. Happily, I can say that war has been avoided. Steady progress toward our ultimate goal has been made, but so much remains to be done. As a private citizen, I shall never cease to do what little I can to help the world advance along that road. And it's high time that we do the same by joining the growing anti-war movement spreading around the globe. That's been your forkful of noodles for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed that. This was a two-part series uh, of talking about the reasons to be anti-war. If you missed the first part, it is uh, on this page, on this channel. So make sure that you are subscribed so you never miss a video. Make sure you hit the bell to get alerts when I drop videos uh, because content like this is often suppressed. Uh, talking about anti-war movements, not really the most popular thing to do in, in a corporate technocracy. So uh, I, I, I very much appreciate everybody that subscribes to this channel. I very much appreciate people that are going to subscribe to this channel. Uh, if you enjoyed this content, please share it. Share it with a friend. Share it with an enemy. Share it with anybody that... Um that you think needs to hear content like this. Uh, that's that's kind of how we get uh, in front of uh, new people. And if you would like to financially contribute to the show, you can do so by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, and starting at only $2 a month, you get exclusive, unreleased stand-up comedy uh, and storytelling material that nobody else has heard except for the sustaining members. Uh, and not just that, you also get early access to the to the full full episode not just breaking it up into parts you get both parts put together into one episode you get early access to that before anybody else does by becoming a patron go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha uh, i'm the only person that works on the show so it'll help me make a living off of my content and help me uh, possibly get to a point where i can pay other people uh, to help me uh, put together these episodes and I can concentrate more on writing and filming and, and, and creating more of the content rather than a lot of the back end stuff. But if you enjoyed this content, if you enjoyed talking about these ideas, uh, that you enjoyed the comedy surrounding uh, philosophy, anti-war movements, uh, uh, late stage capitalism, if you enjoyed comedy that, that, uh, that goes after these things, uh, you'll probably enjoy my live stand-up comedy show. And uh, I'm going to be touring all across the country. I'm touring with my show Politely Angry, uh, which is going to be recorded for an album pretty darn soon. Uh, so catch it while you can. Uh, I am going to be touring uh, just all over the country. I'm going to be uh, doing a show in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, which is in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. So if you're in the, in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So if you're in the Pittsburgh region, uh, make sure you come out to that show. I don't perform in the suburbs very often. So uh, if it's been a while and you live in the burbs, come hang out. It's going to be a super fun time. But I'm also coming to Huntsville, Alabama, Springfield, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Springdale, Arkansas. I'm coming to Denton, Texas, uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I'm opening for my good friend Lee Camp in Dallas, Texas, and Austin, Texas. And then I'm going to be uh, doing my full show in Houston, Texas. I'm going to be in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm going to be in Biloxi, Mississippi. That's right. I'm fucking coming to Mississippi. Uh, I'm going to be in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm going to be in St. Louis, Missouri, Moline, Iowa, Chicago, Indianapolis. I'm going all over the damn place, you guys. Uh, so come hang out with me. For my entire tour schedule, you can go to my website, ramanoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to all the people that have already subscribed, already become patrons. You guys are fucking awesome. You guys are rad as shit. I fucking love you guys. And uh, till next week, we'll see you on the road.